O Lord, take my mind and think through it. Take my lips and speak through them. Take all of our hearts and set them on fire with love for you and for our neighbor. Lord, help us to be present tonight. Even though that one gift we really wanted to give is trapped on some Amazon truck somewhere on the other side of Columbus. And the cinnamon rolls still need to be made so they can rise and be baked first thing in the morning. And we're still trying to figure out how we're going to make it through tomorrow when our mother-in-law comes over. Lord, we want to be present with you because we know that you're still speaking. So Lord, all the distractions, all the worries, all the, all the things that are pulling us out of this moment, Lord, we ask you to take them away so we can hear your voice. Amen. So there are some things in life that you will just never be ready for. Like babies. Nobody's ready to have a baby. There are just varying levels of preparation. But no one's ever ready. I mean, I remember when, uh, when our first baby was ready to be born, Ben. Um, I had just finished playing a round of golf. And uh, I got home and the house was spotless. And I was worried... <clears throat> And I had good reason to be worried, because not 15 minutes after I got home, Cindy's water broke. And I had no idea what to do. I ran up the stairs, I ran down the stairs. I ran up the stairs again. Cindy said, stop running up and down the stairs, that doesn't help anything. (laughs) On the refrigerator is the doctor's number, go call the doctor and tell them we're going to the hospital. So I did what she told me to do. I went down and I found the doctor's number and I called and the doctor didn't pick up because it was 5.03 and apparently the office closes at 5. But we figured it out. We got into the hospital, made it through triage. Cindy got a room and I took a nap and she went into labor. We were not prepared. But by our third kid, we understood the way it worked. When, uh, when Cindy's water broke for Solomon, we didn't frantically run around calling the doctor and rushing to the hospital. We took a break, took a breath, we stopped, we ate dinner, we did a little shopping, and then we eventually showed up to the hospital. (laughs) And Cindy walked around the birthing center, and I took another nap, and everything was fine. You're never ready for a baby, but you can be prepared. And as we look at our first gospel reading tonight, we see that Mary undoubtedly was not ready to give birth to Jesus, but she was prepared for who Jesus would be. In verse 46, Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. 
Mary was prepared because she believed that God was faithful to His covenant promises. The promises that He made to Abraham, and to Isaac, and to Jacob were promises for her. Were promises for her people. That God was not going to remain silent. That Judah would not be under the oppression of Rome forever. She believed that God was just. That He was going to lift up those who were downtrodden, like her, living in the middle of nowhere, in the boondocks of the Roman Empire, a marginalized people group, on the wrong side of the the tracks. Ultimately, she believed that the Messiah would come. And she was prepared. She was prepared for that Messiah to come. The truth is that most of us won't be ready for what God is calling us to. Because God doesn't often call us to easy things. Typically, there's sacrifice required and effort and intentionality and discipline. It's unlikely that we will be ready, but we can be prepared. Because at the center of what it is to be prepared for what God has for us is the practice of prayer. We can be prepared for the life that God has for us when we orient our lives in such a way that prayer is at the center. When the desire of our lives is to dwell in the presence of God. Pastor David uh, talked about the the 50 days of prayer coming up and uh, the household of prayer books that are out in the narthex. And really, all this this 50-day period is, is an opportunity to put to the test whether or not the way of Jesus really works. Whether or not making space for the Holy Spirit to work in our lives will really make it so that we can abide in the center of God's will for us. Now, it's important to point out here that Mary is... uh, maybe 14, 15, 16. She's not an adult, not really. But yet, she is living such a deeply formed life that she's ready for the Messiah. She's ready for this thing that God is calling her to. Part of the story of Mary reminds us that we don't have to wait to get close to God. We don't have to wait. It's not the sort of thing that we have to be these finished products that we bring before the Lord. He receives us as we are. He embraces us as we are. He loves us as we are. He desires to know us as we are. And if you're like me, you already have 15 different reasons why this isn't for you. 15 reasons why the, the, the wholehearted pursuit of God is more than you're willing to, to, to center your life around. And we need to repent of those spirit-quenching justifications for not deciding to chase after all that God has for us. And look, at uh, Mary brings some of them up, right? Power. We say, oh, if we put all of our eggs in the basket of Jesus, there will be people who won't like it, and I'll lose influence. Wealth. Oh, I can't live only working six days a week. 
lose an entire day of productivity? Never. Pride. Wherever I get in this life, I want to get there on my own. We can make all these justifications, but the truth is that what God wants for us is to know Him and to be known by Him. To put all of our trust and all of our hope and all of our eggs in His basket. This is not the sort of thing that we diversify in. But we put all of our trust exclusively in Him. But this is not something that we can do on our own. And because of this, we all should be asking for partners in this journey. I've been a member of many gyms in my life. I know you already knew that. Just look at me, right? No, right? Like, like I've been a member, but that doesn't mean I've used it. Because for most of us, to get the most out of a gym membership, we need people who are going to exercise with us. Because it's hard to get out there and do it on our own. It's hard to follow Jesus without people who love us enough to carry us, to watch over us, to take those, that journey with us. But the good news is that we can be prepared for all God wants to do in and through us. We can. We can keep Jesus at the center. May we choose to do that tonight. Let us pray. Mighty God, we thank you. And we ask for the courage to keep you at the center. Amen. What a night and what a story we tell this evening, the story of Christ's birth. One of my favorite worship services of the Christian year, we like to call it the Super Bowl of our Christian year around here. I think a lot about the traditions that um, we as families and as communities celebrate on Christmas Eve. I bet you have your own traditions and maybe you're observing some of them right now as you gather with family and with friends and in perhaps just a few minutes and hold a candle and sing Silent Night. We think about all the traditions we have as a culture in which we celebrate the birth of Jesus. How many of you have Christmas lights on your house? A few of you? A number of you have Christmas lights? I think about the history of Christmas lights goes all the way back to 1989 when Clark Griswold. <laughs> Some of you got that, didn't you? And actually, I, my understanding, it goes all the way back to the 1880s, shortly after Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, uh, that someone put lights on a strand and began decorating uh, for the season. I mean, clearly not the way many folks do it nowadays. Our friend Dave Harmon sent me a text before the, the Advent season and said, you've got to come see my house. It has music attached to it, and he said it only takes about an hour for the whole program. <laughs> How many of you have Christmas trees? Yeah, everyone has a Christmas tree just about, right? That's a tradition that goes back to the, about the 15th century, 16th century in Germany, as it symbolized uh, eternal life, and it's thought that the first festival of Christmas that had a tree, it was intended to celebrate Christmas and representing uh, the restoration of the Garden of Eden, that Christ came to renew God's creation. And a tree in the center of the town symbolizes the new Eden. Lots of traditions that help us to celebrate this story. The oldest of which, my understanding is, is the nativity. You have a, a simple nativity set in the middle of the chancel this evening to remind us of how that such an old tradition as it is helps us to tell the story. 
I read that St. Francis of Assisi popularized uh, the nativity scene in about the 1200 or so AD, but the earliest representation we have of a nativity scene is found in the catacombs of St. Valentine around 380 AD. It's an ancient Christian symbol that helps us to celebrate the story of Christ's birth. I want you to take some time and just kind of focus your attention on the nativity scene in front of us. We have, of course, Mary and Joseph. That's how the story begins. In Luke's Gospel, we read how Mary and Joseph had to make their way to Bethlehem. The story, of course, is rooted in, in history, and the Romans were taxing the Jews, and they had to report to the town of their lineage. And so Joseph and Mary make their way to Bethlehem. Can you imagine that conversation? In the King James Version, we're told that Mary is great with child. You know what that means. She was not a little bit pregnant. <laughs> Clearly nine months pregnant. She gives birth shortly after arriving in Bethlehem. Other parts of a nativity scene, perhaps, we don't have them in front of us, but might include the shepherds watching over their flocks by night. And tonight, we'll just pretend the shepherds are still in the fields, won't we? And of course, perhaps we even have the wise men, the magi, coming from the east, bringing gifts to the Christ child. They're not on the chancel with us tonight. They're still on their way and won't arrive until Epiphany in just a few weeks. And the one, the one part of the nativity that is most important, of course, is the Christ child. Now, you can't see it, but the Christ child is in the manger tonight. The children in our first service placed him there after lying the strips of cloth to make it more comfortable for the Christ child. But could you imagine a nativity scene in which Jesus was not in the center? Can you imagine a nativity scene where Jesus is sort of off to the side? That wouldn't make sense at all, would it? Having a nativity scene with Jesus still off with the shepherds in the field or off to the east with the wise men, or somewhere in the corner of the room. I, I would like to take credit for this next line, but I, I didn't. Someone gave it to me after the service this evening. They, should, they said I should have said, nobody puts baby in the corner, Dave. <laughs> Isn't that great? We know better. We, we put the baby Jesus. We put the Christ child in the center of the nativity scene where he rightfully belongs. Amen? Amen? Which poses the question for us all tonight, what do we do with Jesus? Not just on this night, but on all other nights. It makes sense to put Jesus in the center of a nativity scene and I want to tell you tonight that it makes even more sense to put Jesus in the center of your life. Amen. I invite you this evening, I encourage you, I implore you to not worship Jesus just one night of the year. We're so glad that you're here. And we invite you to come back or go to another church of your choosing that will help you to put Jesus in the center of your life every day. Pastor Caleb shared with us how we might put Jesus in the center of our life by engaging in prayer, by practicing the disciplines of our faith that allow us to create the space in our life for God to work as we follow Jesus each day. But, but I would like to ask the question as to why we should put Jesus at the center. And the obvious answer is, of course, that's where he rightfully belongs. But what does it mean for us? Why should we put Jesus in the center of our life? There is an illustration that I'll share with you to maybe, maybe drive home the point as to why we should put Jesus at the center of our life. And 
I'm going to invite Pastor Caleb to help me with this. I have here a 100 foot rope. I'm going to ask Caleb to stretch that out as best as he can through the aisle of the sanctuary. Hopefully, it's not tied up in knots after the five thumbs. So look at that. That's great. And this 100-foot rope, rope I purchased at Lowe's recently, I think, a couple months or so ago. And imagine that rope continues out the door and crosses uh, Zollinger Road uh, all the way through the northern parts of Franklin County into Delaware County, where I live, and stretches even past up past Union County, where Pastor Caleb lives, all the way through Ohio, across that state up north even into Canada, and continues to circle around the globe. That'd be a long rope, wouldn't it? But imagine, if you will, that that rope, as long as it may be, symbolizes eternity. On, on the end of the rope here, I placed a piece of red tape. And what I, what I want you to imagine in, in your mind tonight is that this piece of red tape on this rope that symbolizes eternity, this red tape symbolizes our life on earth. Think about all the time and energy and plans that we make for this little piece of tape, this little stretch of time that we spend on earth. And some of us are about right here, just getting started in our earthly life. Some of us are toward the middle, are starting to feel the aches and pains of middle age. Some of us are getting closer to retirement. <laughs> Still others are toward the end of that little piece of tape that symbolizes our life on earth. Think about all the plans you make, all the things that you work for, all the dreams you have and hopes you have. Imagine that your existence is designed and revolved around those 80 or 90 years that we get to circle this globe. And don't take into consideration the rest of rope. Seems kind of foolish, doesn't it? Seems kind of foolish to live only for that little piece when all of this is before us. What do we do with Jesus? And what I want to encourage you to think about tonight is what we do with Jesus in this little stretch of our existence impacts the rest of our existence. If we name Christ as our Savior in this part of our existence, we live with Christ throughout the rest of our existence. Amen. And yet if we reject Christ in this part of our existence, we face eternity with a Christless existence. What do we do with Jesus? I want to give you the invitation tonight on this Christmas Eve to simply make the decision in your heart and your mind to put Jesus at the center. In our previous service, a young man was baptized at the conclusion of our time together. And I, we asked him if he desired to be baptized in the Christian faith, and that young man said, yes, I do. And we quoted from Romans chapter 10, verse 9, which says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. I asked that young man, do you believe this? He said, yes, I do. And we baptized him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, believing that that process of confessing and faith and action impacts a person's eternity. Because it allows an individual like that young man and like you to put Jesus Will you do that tonight? Right where you are, 
no matter where you've come from, no matter how far you've come to be here, will you put Jesus at the center? Let me pray with you this evening. God, forgive us for chasing after so many things that this brief life offers. Wealth and power, success and pleasure. Forgive us for chasing after the things that so often in our lives are nothing but empty wells promising things that do not satisfy. And tonight, Lord, as we tell the story once again of Christ's birth, we're reminded of the importance of keeping Jesus at the center. And tonight we're doing just that, Lord, as we've gathered with family and friends and strangers alike. We're worshiping. We're telling the story. We're singing the songs of faith. And what a wonderful night to do just that. Help us to continue when tonight is over and tomorrow begins, to keep Jesus at the center. All this we ask in